This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 16, Part 1. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Bloom brushed off the greater bulk of the shavings and handed Stephen the hat and ash plant, and bucked him up generally in orthodox Samaritan's fashion, which he very badly needed. His, Stephen's, mind was not exactly what you would call wandering, but a bit unsteady, and on his expressed desire for some beverage to drink, Mr. Bloom, in view of the hour it was, and there being no pump of vartry water available for their ablutions, let alone drinking purposes, hit upon an expedient by suggesting, off the reel, the propriety of the cabman's shelter, as it was called, hardly a stone-throw away, near Butbridge, where they might hit upon some drinkables, in the shape of a milk and soda, or a mineral. But how to get there was the rub, for the nonce he was rather nonplussed, but inasmuch as the duty plainly devolved upon him to take some measures on the subject, he pondered suitable ways and means during which Stephen repeatedly yawned. So far as he could see, he was rather pale in the face, so that it occurred to him as highly advisable to get a conveyance of some description, which would answer to their then condition. Both of them being ED'd, particularly Stephen, always assuming that there was such a thing to be found. Accordingly, after a few such preliminaries as brushing, in spite of his having forgotten to take up his rather soap-suddy handkerchief after it had done yeoman service on the shaving line, they both walked together along Beaver Street, or, more properly, Lane, as far as the farriers, and then, and the distinctly fetid atmosphere of the livery stables at the corner of Montgomery Street, where they made tracks to the left, from thence debouching into Amiens Street round the corner of Dan Bergen's. But, as he confidently anticipated, there was not a sign of a Jehu plying for hire anywhere to be seen except a four-wheeler, probably engaged by some fellows inside of the spree, outside the North Star Hotel, and there was no symptom of its budging a quarter of an inch, when Mr. Bloom, who was anything but a professional whistler, endeavoured to hail it by emitting a kind of a whistle, holding his arms arched over his head twice. This was a quandary, but, bringing common sense to bear on it, evidently there was nothing for it but to put a good face on the matter, and foot it, which they accordingly did. So, bevelling around by mullets and the signal-house, which they shortly reached, they proceeded perforce in the direction of Amiens Street Railway Terminus, Mr. Bloom being handicapped by the circumstance that one of the back-buttons of his trousers had to vary the time-honoured adage, gone the way of all buttons, though entering thoroughly into the spirit of the thing, he heroically made light of the mischance. So as neither of them were particularly pressed for time, as it happened, and the temperature refreshing since it cleared up after the recent visitation of Jupiter Pluvius, they dandered along past by where the empty vehicle was waiting, without a fare or a jarve. As it so happened, a Dublin United Tramways Company's sandstrewer happened to be returning, and the elder man recounted to his companion, apropos of the incident, his own truly miraculous escape of some little while back. They passed the main entrance of the Great Northern Railway Station, the starting point for Belfast, where of course all traffic was suspended at that late hour, and passing the back door of the morgue, a not very enticing locality, not to say gruesome to a degree, more especially at night, ultimately gained the dock tavern and in due course turned into Store Street, famous for its Sea Division police station. Between this point and the high at present unlit warehouses of Beresford Place, Stephen thought to think of Ibsen, associated with Baird's the stonecutters in his mind somehow in Talbot Place, first turning on the right, where the other, who was acting as his Fidus Arcates, inhaled with internal satisfaction the smell of James Rook's city bakery, situated 
quite close to where they were, the very palatable odour indeed of our daily bread, of all commodities of the public, the primary and most indispensable. Bread, the staff of life, earn your bread, oh, tell me where is fancy bread, at Rourke's the baker's, it is said. En route to his taciturn, and, not to put too fine a point on it, not yet perfectly sober companion, Mr. Bloom, who at all events was in complete possession of his faculties, never more so, in fact, disgustingly sober, spoke a word of caution, read the dangers of night-town, women of ill fame, and swell mobsmen, which, barely permissible once in a while, though not as a habitual practice, was of the nature of a regular death-trap for young fellows of his age, particularly if they had acquired drinking habits, under the influence of liquor, unless you knew a little jiu-jitsu for every contingency, as even a fellow on the broad of his back could administer a nasty kick if he didn't look out. Highly providential was the appearance on the scene of Corny Callagher, when Stephen was blissfully unconscious, but for that man in the gap, turning up at the eleventh hour, the fini might have been, that he might have been a candidate for the accident ward, or, failing that, the bridewell, and an appearance in the court next day, before Mr. Tobias, or, he being the solicitor, rather, old wall, he meant to say, or Mahoney, which simply spelt ruined for a chap when he got brooted about. The reason he mentioned the fact was that a lot of those policemen, whom he cordially disliked, were admittedly unscrupulous in the service of the Crown, and, as Mr. Bloom put it, recalling a case or two in the A Division in Glan Brussel Street, prepared to swear a hole through a ten-gallon pot. Never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example, the guardians of the law were well in evidence, the obvious reason being they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or side-arms of any description liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to enticing them against civilians, should by any chance they fall out over anything. You frittered away your time, he very sensibly maintained, and health, and also character, besides which the squandermania of the thing, fast women of the demi-monde, ran away with a lot of LSD into the bargain, and the greatest danger of all was who you got drunk with, though, touching the much-vexed question of stimulants. He relished a glass of choice old wine in season as both nourishing and blood-making, and possessing aperient virtues, notably a good burgundy, which he was a staunch believer in. Yet never beyond a certain point, where he invariably drew the line, as it simply led to trouble all round, to say nothing of your being at the tender mercy of others, practically. Most of all, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pub-hunting confrères, but one, a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother medicus, under all the circles. And that one was Judas, Stephen said, who up to then had said nothing whatsoever of any kind. Discussing these and kindred topics, they made a bee-line across the back of the custom-house, and passed under the loop-line bridge, where a brazier of coke burning in front of a sentry-box or something like one attracted their rather lagging footsteps. Stephen, of his own accord, stopped for no special reason to look at the heap of barren cobblestones, and by the light emanating from the brazier he could just make out the darker figure of the corporation watchman inside the gloom of the sentry-box. He began to remember that this has happened, or had been mentioned as having happened before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognised in the sentry a quondam friend of his father's, Gumley. To avoid a meeting, he drew nearer to the pillars of the railway bridge. "'Someone saluted you,' Mr. Bloom said. A figure of middle height on the prowl evidently under the arches saluted again, calling, "'Night!' Stephen, of course, started rather dizzily, and stopped to return the compliment. Mr. Bloom actuated by motives of inherent delicacy, inasmuch as he always believed in minding his own business, 
moved off, but nevertheless remained on the qui-vive, with just a shade of anxiety, though not funkyish in the least. Though unusual in the Dublin area, he knew it was not by any means unknown for desperadoes, who had next to nothing to live on, to be abroad waylaying and generally terrorizing peaceable pedestrians by placing a pistol at the head in some secluded spot outside the city proper, famished loiterers of the Thames embankment category. They might be hanging about there, or simply marauders, ready to decamp with whatever boodle they could, in one fell swoop of a moment's notice, your money or your life, leaving you there to point a moral, gagged and garroted. Stephen, that is, when the accosting figure came to close quarters, though he was not in an over-sober state himself, recognised Corley's breath, redolent of rotten corn-juice. Lord John Corley, some called him, and his genealogy came about in this wise. He was the eldest son of Inspector Corley of the G Division, lately deceased, who had married a certain Catherine Brophy, the daughter of a loose farmer. His grandfather, Patrick Michael Corley of New Ross, had married the widow of a publican there, whose maiden name had been Catherine, also, Talbot. Rumour had it, though not proved, that she descended from the house of the Lords Talbot de Malahide, in whose mansion, really an unquestionably fine residence of its kind, and well worth seeing, her mother or aunt, or some relative, a woman, as the tale went, of extreme beauty, had enjoyed the distinction of being in service in the wash-kitchen. This, therefore, was the reason why the still comparatively young, though dissolute man, who now addressed Stephen, was spoken of by some with facetious proclivities, as Lord John Corley. Taking Stephen on one side, he had the customary doleful ditty to tell. Not as much as a farthing to purchase a night's lodgings. His friends had all deserted him. Furthermore, he had a row with Lenehan, and called him to Stephen a mean bloody swab, with a sprinkling of a number of other uncalled-for expressions. He was out of a job, and implored of Stephen to tell him where on God's earth he could get something, anything at all, to do. No, it was the daughter of the mother in the wash-kitchen that was four-sister to the heir of the house, or else they were connected through the mother in some way, both occurrences happening at the same time, if the whole thing wasn't a complete fabrication from start to finish. Anyhow, he was all in. I wouldn't ask you only, pursued he, on my solemn oath, and God knows I'm on the rocks. There'll be a job to-morrow or next day, Stephen told him, in a boys' school at Dalkey, for a gentleman usher. Mr. Garrett Deasy, try it. You may mention my name. Ah, oh, God, Corley replied, sure I couldn't teach in a school, man. I was never one of your bright ones, he added with a half-laugh. I got stuck twice in the junior at the Christian Brothers. I have no place to sleep myself, Stephen informed him. Corley, at the first go-off, was inclined to suspect it was for something to do with Stephen being fired out of his digs, for bringing in a bloody tart off the street. There was a doss-house in Marlborough Street, Mrs. Maloney's, but it was only a tanner touch, and full of undesirables, but McConaughey told him you got a decent enough do in the Brazen Head, over in Wine Tavern Street, which was distantly suggestive to the person addressed of Friar Bacon, for a bob. He was starving, too, though he hadn't said a word about it. Though this sort of thing went on every other night, or very near it, still Stephen's feelings got the better of him, in a sense, though he knew that Corley's brand-new rigmarole, on a par with the others, was hardly deserving of much credence. However, how it ignarus malorum miseris succurere, disco, etc., etc., as the Latin poet remarks, especially as luck would have it. He got paid his screw after every middle of the month on the 16th, which was the date of the month, as a matter of fact, though a good bit of the wherewithal was demolished. But the cream of the joke was nothing would get it out of Corley's head that he was living in affluence, 
and hadn't a thing to do but hand out the needful. Whereas, he put his hand in a pocket anyhow, not with the idea of finding any food there, but thinking he might lend him anything up to a bob or so, in lieu so that he might endeavour at all events and get sufficient to eat. But the result was in the negative, for, to his chagrin, he found his cash missing. A few broken biscuits were all the result of his investigation. He tried his hardest to recollect for the moment whether he had lost as well he might have, or left, because in that contingency it was not a pleasant lookout. Very much the reverse, in fact. He was altogether too fagged out to institute a thorough search, though he tried to recollect. About biscuits, he dimly remembered. Who now exactly gave them, he wondered, or where was he, or did he buy? However, in another pocket he came across what he surmised in the dark were pennies, erroneously, however, as it turned out. Those are half-crowns, man, Corley corrected him. And so, in point of fact, they turned out to be. Stephen anyhow lent him one of them. Thanks, Corley answered. You're a gentleman. I'll pay you back one time. Who's that with you? I saw him a few times in the bleeding house in Camden Street with Boylan, the bill-sticker. You might put in a good word for us, to get me taken on there. I'd carry a sandwich board, only the girl in the office told me they're full up for the next three weeks, man. God, you've to book ahead, man. You'd think it was for the Carl Rosa. I don't give a shite anyway, so long as I get a job, even as a crossing sweeper. Subsequently, being not quite so down in the mouth, after the two and six he got, he informed Stephen about a fellow by the name of Bags Komiski, that he said Stephen knew well out of Fulham's, the ship chandlers, bookkeeper there that used to be often round in Nagel's back with Omara, and a little chap with a stutter the name of Ty. Anyhow, he was lagged the night before last, and fined ten bob for a drunken disorderly, and refusing to go with the constable. Mr. Bloom, in the meanwhile, kept dodging about in the vicinity of the cobblestones near the brazier of coke, in front of the corporation watchman's sentry-box, who evidently a glutton for work, it struck him, was having a quiet, fortry winks, for all intents and purposes on his own private account, while Dublin slept. He threw an odd eye at the same time, now and then, at Stephen's anything but immaculately attired into locutor, but if he had seen that nobleman somewhere or other, though where he was not in a position to truthfully state, nor had he the remotest idea when. Being a level-headed individual, who could give points to not a few in point of shrewd observation, he also remarked on his very dilapidated hat and slouchy wearing apparel, generally testifying to a chronic impecuniosity. Palpably, he was one of his hangers-on, but for the matter of that, it was merely a question of one preying on his next-door neighbour all round, in every deep, so to put it, a deeper depth, and for the matter of that, if the man in the street chanced to be on the dock himself, penal servitude, with or without the option of a fine, would be a very rara vide altogether. In any case, he had a consummate account of cool assurances, intercepting people at that hour of the night or morning. Pretty thick, that was, certainly. The pair parted company, and Stephen rejoined Mr. Bloom, who, with his practised eye, was not without perceiving that he had succumbed to the blandiloquence of the other parasite. Alluding to the encounter, he said laughingly, Stephen, that is, he is down on his luck. He asked me to ask you to ask somebody ma named Boylan, a bill-sticker, to give him a job as a sandwich man. At this intelligence, in which he seemingly evinced little interest, Mr. Bloom gazed abstractedly for the space of a half a second or so in the direction of a bucket dredger, rejoicing in the far-famed name of Ablana, moored alongside Custom House Quay, and quite possibly out of repair whereupon he observed evasively, "'Everybody gets their own ration of luck, they say. Now you mention it, his face was familiar to me. But, leaving that for the moment, how much did you part with?' he queried, "'if I'm not too inquisitive.' 
half a crown. Stephen responded, I dare say he needs it to sleep somewhere. Needs? Mr. Bloom ejaculated, professing not the least surprise at the intelligence. I can quite credit the assertion, and I guarantee he invariably does. Every one according to his needs, or every one according to his deeds. But talking about things in general, where, he added with a smile, will you sleep yourself? Walking to Sandy Cove is out of the question. And even supposing you did, you won't get in after what occurred in Westland Row Station. Simply fag out there for nothing. I don't mean to presume to dictate you in the slightest degree, but why did you leave your father's house? To seek misfortune, was Stephen's answer. I met your respected father on a recent occasion, Mr. Bloom diplomatically returned, today, in fact, or to be strictly accurate, on yesterday. Where does he live at present? I gathered in the course of conversation that he had moved. I believe he is in Dublin somewhere, Stephen answered unconcernedly. Why? A gifted man, Mr. Bloom said of Mr. Dedalus, senior, in more respects than one, and a born raconteur, if ever there was one. He takes great pride, quite legitimate, out of you. You could go back, perhaps, he hazarded, still thinking of the very unpleasant scene in Westland Road Terminus, when it was perfectly evident that the other two, Mulligan, that is, and that English truest friend of his, who evidently you could, their third companion, was patently trying, as if the whole bawly station belonged to them, to give Stephen the slip in the confusion, which they did. There was no response forthcoming to the suggestion, however, such as it was, Stephen's mind's eye being too busily engaged in repicturing his family hearth the last time he saw it, with his sister Dilly, sitting by the ingle, her hair hanging down, waiting for some weak Trinidad shell cocoa that was in the suit-coated kettle to be done, so that she and he could drink it with the oatmeal water for milk, after the Friday herrings they had eaten at two a penny with an egg apiece for Maggie, Booty, and Katie, the cat, meanwhile, under the mangle, devouring a mess of eggshells and charred fish-heads and bones on a square of brown paper, in accordance with the third precept of the church, to fast and abstain on the days commanded, it being quarter tense, or if not, ember days, or something like that. No, Mr. Bloom repeated again, I wouldn't personally repose much trust in that boon companion of yours, who contributes the humorous element. Dr. Mulligan, as a guide, philosopher, and friend, if I were in your shoes. He knows which side his bread is buttered on, though in all probability he never realized what it is to be without regular meals. Of course he didn't notice as much as I did, but it wouldn't occasion me the least surprise to learn that a pinch of tobacco or some narcotic was put in your drink, for some ulterior object. He understood, however, from all he heard, that Dr. Mulligan was a versatile all-round man, by no means confined to medicine only, who was rapidly coming to the fore in his line, and, if the report was verified, bade fair to enjoy a flourishing practice in the not-too-distant future as a tony medical practitioner, drawing a handsome fee for his services, in addition to which professional status, his rescue of that man from certain drowning by artificial respiration, and what they call first aid at Scaris, or Malahide, was it? Was, he was bound to admit, an exceedingly plucky deed, which he could not too highly praise, so that, frankly, he was utterly at a loss to fathom what earthly reason could be at the back of it, except, he put down, to sheer cussedness or jealousy, pure and simple. Except it simply amounts to one thing, and he is what they call picking your brains he ventured to throw out. The guarded glance of half-solitude, half-curiosity, augmented by friendliness, which he gave at Stephen's, at present morose expression of features, did not throw a flood of light, none at all, in fact, on the problem as to whether he had let himself be badly bamboozled to judge by two or three low-spirited remarks he let drop, or the other way about saw through the affair, and for some reason or other best known to himself, allowed matters to more or less. 
Grinding poverty did have that effect, and he more than conjectured that high educational abilities though he possessed, he experienced no little difficulty in making both ends meet. Adjacent to the men's public urinal, they perceived an ice-cream car, round which a group of presumably Italians in heated altercation were getting rid of voluble expressions in their vivacious language, in a particularly animated way, there being some little differences between the parties. Putana Madonna, che ci dia i quattrini, o ragione, culo rotto, intendiamoci, mezzo sovrano più, dice lui però, mezzo, farabuto, mortacci sui, ma ascolta, cinque la testa più. Mr. Bloom and Stephen entered the cabman's shelter, an unpretentious wooden structure, where, prior to then, he had rarely, if ever, been before, the former having previously whispered to the latter a few hints anent the keeper of it, said to be the once famous Skin the Goat Fitzharris, the Invincible, though he could not vouch for the actual facts, which quite possibly there was not one vestige of truth in. A few moments later saw our two noctambules safely seated in a discreet corner, only to be greeted by stares from the decidedly miscellaneous collection of waifs and strays, and other nondescript specimens of the genus Homo, already there engaged in eating and drinking diversified by conversation, for whom they seemingly formed an object of marked curiosity. Now touching a cup of coffee, Mr. Bloom ventured to plausibly suggest to break the ice, it occurs to me you ought to sample something in the shape of solid food, say a roll of some description. Accordingly, his first act was, with characteristic sang froid, to order these commodities quietly. The hoi polloi of Jarvis, or Steve Dawes, or whatever they were after a cursory examination, turned their eyes apparently dissatisfied away, though one red-bearded, bibulous individual portion of whose hair was greyish, a sailor probably, still stared for some appreciable time, before transferring his rapt attention to the floor. Mr. Bloom, availing himself of the right of free speech, he having just a bowling acquaintance with the language in dispute, though, to be sure, rather in a quandary over volio, remarked to his protégé in an audible tone of voice, apropos of the battle royal in the street, which was still raging fast and furious. A beautiful language. I mean, for singing purposes. Why do you not write your poetry in that language? Bella poetria. It is so melodious and full. Bella donna. Voglio. Stephen, who was trying his dead best to yawn if he could, suffering from lassitude generally, replied, To fill the ear of a cow-elephant. They were haggling over money. "'Is that so?' Mr. Bloom asked. "'Of course,' he subjoined pensively, at the inward reflection of there being more languages to start with than were absolutely necessary. "'It may be only the southern glamour that surrounds it.' The keeper of the shelter in the middle of this tete-a-tete put a boiling swimming cup of a choice concoction labelled coffee on the table and a rather antediluvian specimen of a bun, or so it seemed." after which he beat a retreat to his counter, Mr. Bloom determining to have a good square look at him later on, so as not to appear to. For which reason he encouraged Stephen to proceed with his eyes, while he did the honours of surreptitiously pushing the cup of what was temporarily supposed to be called coffee gradually nearer him. "'Sounds are impostures,' Stephen said after a pause of some little time, like names, Cicero, Podmore, Napoleon, Mr. Goodbody, Jesus, Mr. Doyle. Shakespeare's were as common as Murphy's. What's in a name? Yes, to be sure, Mr. Bloom unaffectedly concurred. Of course. Our name was changed, too, he added, pushing the so-called roll across. The red-bearded sailor, who had his weather eye on the newcomers, boarded Stephen, whom he had singled out for attention in particular, squarely by asking... "'And what might your name be?' "'Just in the nick of time Mr. Bloom touched his companion's boot, "'but Stephen, apparently disregarding the warm pressure "'from an unexpected quarter, answered, 
Dedalus. The sailor stared at him heavily for a pair of drowsy, baggy eyes, rather bunged up from excessive use of booze. Preferably good old Hollands and water. You know Simon Dedalus? he asked at length. I've heard of him, Stephen said. Mr. Bloom was all at sea for a moment, seeing the others evidently eavesdropping, too. He's Irish, the seaman boldly affirmed, staring still in much the same way and nodding. All Irish. All too Irish, Stephen rejoined. As for Mr. Bloom, he could neither make head or tail of the whole business, and he was just asking himself what possible connection, when the sailor of his own accord turned to the other occupants of the shelter with a remark, "'I've seen him shoot two eggs off two bottles at fifty yards over his shoulder, the left hand dead shot.' Though he was slightly hampered by an occasional stammer, and his gestures being also clumsy as it was, still he did his best to explain. "'Bottles out there, say. Fifty yards measured. Eggs on the bottles. Cox's gun over his shoulder. Ames.' He turned his body half round, shut up his right eye completely. Then he screwed his features up some way sideways, and glared out into the night with an unprepossessing cast of countenance. Pum! he then shouted once. The entire audience waited, anticipating an additional detonation, there being still a further egg. Pum! he shouted twice. Egg too evidently demolished, he nodded and winked, adding blood thirstily. Buffalo Bill shoots to kill, never missed, nor he never will. A silence ensued, till Mr. Bloom, for agreeableness' sake, just felt like asking him whether it was for a marksmanship competition like the Bisley. Beg pardon, the sailor said. Long ago, Mr. Bloom pursued, without flinching a hair's breadth. Why? the sailor replied, relaxing to a certain extent under the magic influence of diamond cut diamond. It might be a matter of ten years. He toured the wide world with Hengler's Royal Circus. I've seen him do that in Stockholm. Curious coincidence, Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen unobtrusively. Murphy's my name, the sailor continued. D. B. Murphy. Of Carrigallo. Know where that is? Queenstown Harbour, Stephen replied. That's right, the sailor said. Fort Camden and Fort Carlisle. That's where I hails from. I belongs there. That's where I hails from. My little woman's down there. She's waiting for me, I know. For England, home and beauty. She's my own true wife I haven't seen for seven years now, sailing about. Mr. Bloom could easily picture his advent on this scene, the homecoming to the mariner's roadside sheeling, after having diddled Davy Jones a rainy night with a blind moon. Across the world for a wife. Quite a number of stories there were on that particular Alice Ben Bolt topic, Enoch Arden and Rip Van Winkle, and does anybody hereabouts remember a cow colliery, a favourite and most trying declamation piece, by the way of poor John Casey and a bit of perfect poetry in its own small way. Never about the runaway wife coming back, however much devoted to the absentee. The face at the window, judge of his astonishment when he finally did breast the tape and the awful truth dawned upon him and end his better half, wrecked in his affections. You little expected me, but I've come to stay and make a fresh start. There she sits, a grass widow, at the self-same fireside, believes me dead, rocked in the cradle of the deep. And there sits Uncle Chubb or Tomkin, as the case might be, the publican of the crown and anchor, in shirt-sleeves, eating rump-steak and onions. No choir for father. Brew the wind! Her brand-new arrival is on her knee post-mortem child, with a high row and a randy row, and my galloping tearing tendy. Oh, bow to the inevitable, grin and bear it. I remain with much love your broken-hearted husband, D. B. Murphy. 
The sailor, who scarcely seemed to be a Dublin resident, turned to one of the Jarvies with a request. "'You don't happen to have such a thing as a spared shore about you?' The Jarvey addressed, as it happened, had not, but the keeper took a die of plug from his good jacket, hanging on a nail, and the desired object was passed from hand to hand. "'Thank you,' the sailor said. He deposited the quid in his gob, and, chewing and with some slow stammers, proceeded. "'We come up this morning, eleven o'clock. The three-master rose Vian from Bridgewater with bricks. I shipped to get over. Paid off this afternoon. There's my discharge. See? D. B. Murphy. A. B. S.' in confirmation of which statement he extricated from an inside pocket and handed to his neighbour a not very clean-looking folded document. "'You must have seen a fair share of the world,' the keeper remarked, leaning on the counter. "'Why?' the sailor answered upon reflection upon it. "'I've circumnavigated a bit since I first joined on. I was in the Red Sea. I was in China, North America, and South America. We was chased by pirates one voyage. I seen icebergs plenty.' growlers. I was in Stockholm and the Black Sea, the Dardanelles under Captain Dalton, the best bloody man that ever scuttled a ship. I seen Russia. Gospodi pomilyu. That's how the Russians praise. You seen queer sights, don't be talking, put in a Jarve. Why, the sailor said, shifting his partially chewed plug, I seen queer things too, ups and downs. I seen a crocodile bite the fluke of an anchor, same as I'd chew that quid. He took out of his mouth the pulpy quid, and lodging it between his teeth, bit ferociously. Can! Like that. And I seen man-eaters in Peru that eats corpses and the livers of horses. Look here. Here they are. A friend of mine sent me. He fumbled out a picture postcard from his inside pocket, which seemed to be in its way a species of repository, and pushed it along the table. The printed matter on it stated, Rosa de Indios, Beni, Bolivia. All focused their attention at the scene exhibited, a group of savage women in striped loincloths, squatting, blinking, suckling, frowning, sleeping, amid a swarm of infants. There must have been quite a score of them. Outside some primitive shanties of Osier. Choose coca all day, the communicative top Walden added. Stomachs like bread graters. Cuts off their diddies when they can't bear no more children. See them sitting there, stark ballock naked, eating a dead horse's liver raw. His postcard proved a centre of attraction for Messrs. the Greenhorns for several minutes, if not more. Know how to keep them off? he inquired generally. Nobody volunteering a statement, he winked, saying, "'Glass, that boggles him. Glass.' Mr. Bloom, without evincing surprise, unostentatiously turned over the card to peruse that partially obliterated address and postmark. It ran as follows. "'Tarjeta postal, Señor Aboudin, Galeria Becque, Santiago, Chile.' There was no message, evidently, as he took particular notice. Though not an implicit believer in the lurid story narrated, or the egg-sniping transaction, for that matter, despite William Tell and the Lazarillo Don Cesar de Bazan incident depicted in Maritana, on which occasion the former's ball passed through the latter's hat, having detected a discrepancy between his name, assuming he was the person he represented himself to be, and not sailing under false colours, after having boxed the compass on the strict QT somewhere, and the fictitious addressee of the missive which made him nourish some suspicions of our friend's bona fides, nevertheless it reminded him, in a way, of a long-cherished plan he meant to one day realise, some Wednesday or Saturday, of travelling to London via long sea, not to say that he had ever travelled extensively to any great extent. But he was at heart a born adventurer, though by a trick of fate he had consistently remained a landlubber, except you call going to Holyhead, which was his longest. Martin Cunningham frequently said he would work a pass through Egan, 
but some deuced hitch or other equally cropped up with the net result that the scheme fell through. But even suppose it did come to planking down the needful and breaking Boyd's heart, it was not so dear, purse permitting, a few guineas at the outside, considering the fare to Mullingar, where he figured on going was five and six there and back. The trip would benefit health, on account of the brazing ozone, and be in every way thoroughly pleasurable, especially for a chap whose liver was out of order, seeing the different places along the route, Plymouth, Falmouth, Southampton, and so culminating in an instructive tour of the sites of the great metropolis, the spectacle of our modern Babylon, where doubtless he would see the greatest improvement, Tower, Abbey, Wealth of Park Lane, drew a new acquaintance with. Another thing just struck him, as a by no means bad notion, was that he might have a gaze around the spot to see about trying to make arrangements about a concert tour of summer music embracing the most prominent pleasure resorts, Margate with mixed bathing and first-rate hydras and spas, Eastbourne, Scarborough, Margate and so on, beautiful Bournemouth, the Channel Islands and similar bijou spots, which might prove highly remunerative. Not, of course, with hole-and-corner scratch company or local ladies on the job. Witness Mrs. C. P. McCoy, type. Lend me your valise and I'll post you the ticket. No, something top-notch. An all-star Irish cast. The Tweedy Flower Grand Opera Company with his own legal consort as leading lady, as a sort of counterblast to the Elster Grimes, and moody manners. Perfectly simple matter, and he was quite sanguine of success, providing puffs in the local papers could be managed by some fellow with a bit of a bounce, who could pull the indispensable wires and thus combine business with pleasure. But who? That was the rub. Also, without being actually positive, it struck him, a great field was to be opened up, in the lines of opening up new routes to keep pace with the times apropos of the fishguard Rosslare route, which, it was mooted, was once more on the tapis in the circumlocution departments, with the usual quantity of red tape and dilly-dallying, of effet fogidum and dunderheads generally. A great opportunity there certainly was for push and enterprise to meet the travelling needs of the public at large, the average man, that is, Brown, Robinson, and co. It was a subject of regret, and absurd as well on the face of it, and no small blame in our vaunted society that the man in the street, when the system really needed toning up, for the matter of a couple of paltry pounds, was debarred from seeing more of the world they lived in, instead of being always and ever cooped up, since my old stick in the mud took me for a wife. After all, hang it, they had their eleven and more humdrum months of it, and merited a radical change of venue, after the grind of city life and the summer time for choice, when Dame Nature is at her spectacular best, substituting nothing short of a new lease of life. There were equally excellent opportunities for vacationists in that home island, delightful sylvan spots for rejuvenation, offering a plethora of attractions as well as bracing tonic for the system in and around Dublin and its picturesque environs, even Pula Fuca, to which there was a steam tram, but also farther away from the madding crowd in Wicklow, rightly termed the Garden of Ireland, an ideal neighbourhood for elderly wheelmen, so long as it didn't come down, and in the wilds of Donegal, where if report spoke true, the coup d'oeil was exceedingly grand, though the last-named locality was not easily gettable so that the influx of visitors was not as yet all that it might be, considering the signal benefits to be derived from it, while Howth, with its historic associations and otherwise, Silken Thomas, Grace O'Malley, George the Fourth, rhododendrons several hundred feet above sea level, was a favourite haunt, with all sorts and conditions of men, especially in the spring, when young men's fancy, though it had its own toll of deaths, by falling off the cliffs, by design or accidentally, usually, by the way, on their left leg, it being only about three-quarters of an hour run from the pillar. 
because of course up-to-date tourist travelling was as yet merely in its infancy, so to speak, and the accommodation left much to be desired. Interesting to fathom, it seemed to him from a motive of curiosity, pure and simple, was whether it was the traffic that created the route, or vice versa, or the two sides, in fact. He turned back the other side of the card picture and passed it along to Stephen. I seen a Chinese one time, related the doughty narrator, that had little pills like putty, and he put them in the water, and they opened, and every pill was something different. One was a ship, another was a house, another was a flower. Cooks rats in your soup, he appetizingly added, the chinks does, possibly perceiving an expression of dubiosity on their faces. The globetrotter went on, adhering to his adventures. And I seen a man killed in Trieste by an Italian chap, knife in his back, knife like that. While speaking, he produced a dangerous-looking clasp knife, quite in keeping with his character, and held it in the striking position. In a knocking shop it was, count of a tyrant between two smugglers. The fellow hid behind a door, come up behind him, like that. Prepare to meet your god, says he. Chuck! It went into his back, up to the butt. His heavy glance drowsily roamed about, kind of defied their further questions, even should they by any chance want to. That's a good bit of steel, repeated he, examining his formidable stiletto. After which harrowing denouement, sufficient to appall the stoutest, he snapped the blade too, and stowed the weapon in question away, as before in his chamber of horrors, otherwise pocket. They're great for the cold steel, somebody who was evidently quite in the dark said for the benefit of them all. That was why they thought the park murderers of the Invincibles was done by foreigners, on account of them using knives. At this remark, passed obviously in the spirit of where ignorance is bliss, Mr. B. and Stephen, each in his own particular way, both instinctively exchanged meaning glances, in a religious silence of the strictly entre nous variety, however, towards where skin the goat, Elias the keeper, alias the keeper, not turning a hair, was drawing spurts of liquid from his boiler affair. His inscrutable face, which was really a work of art, a perfect study in itself, beggaring description, conveyed the expression that he didn't understand one jot of what was going on. Funny, very. End of section 16, part 1 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June 2006